We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall, and welcome to The Meaningful Life. It's good to look back from time to time and think about what you've learned so all that hard-won knowledge doesn't run through your fingers and instead turns into concrete changes in your day-to-day life. To help me look back at my guests in 2021, I've invited my producer, Michael Dooney. He was a guest along with his wife, reflecting on the changes having a baby made to their lives just a few weeks after their daughter arrived in the world. It is episode 26 if you'd like to listen. The formula is simple for this podcast. We have chosen five episodes each. We will listen again to a clip and discuss the insights. In the bonus section, please consider becoming a supporter and funding future episodes. I will cover how to turn your learning from the past 12 months into a daily practice and sharing my own. So, Michael, it's rather strange inviting you onto my podcast, but (laughs) welcome. So, was it difficult actually having to think about five different episodes that sort of had really stuck in your mind and taught you something? It was difficult narrowing it down to five because I feel like every episode that I edit, there's always a lesson to be learned or there's always something I can take away. And then it was trying to go back over one year's worth of podcasts and think which were the ones that really stuck with me and what ones do I really want to highlight. So, What criteria ultimately did you use? I think the ones that I keep coming back to when I'm talking to other people about the podcast and I'm saying, oh, you should listen to this episode or, you know, this really resonated with me. That's really more how I picked them. It was more ones that I've repeated to other people. I thought, okay, maybe this is a good gauge. If I'm telling other people about it, then there's obviously something there. Well, what I've done is I've found that certain ideas have sort of stuck with me and I've sort of been thinking about them, not just on the time I heard them, but they've actually stayed with me through the whole of the 12 months and actually have either influenced the way I work in my office or actually change the way I look at the world. I mean, I've got quite a high bar, which doesn't mean that actually all the rest of the guests I didn't actually learn something from, but these are the ones that somehow have actually found their way into the fabric of my life. So um, it will be good to be able to listen back to them. I've had some guesses about who I think you have chosen. I'm not going to tell you. (laughs) I don't know who you've chosen. And I'll tell you afterwards if I got them right or not. I could actually only come up with three that I thought, "Mm, I think it's a very high likelihood that you would have those people, but we will find out. Yes. (laughs) So let's look at the first person that I've chosen and we'll alternate between the two of us. So the first person I've chosen is Caroline Madden, who is episode 19. Caroline is a pro marriage therapist from the USA and we were talking about betrayal. That's her main work and I suppose it's probably about half of my work as well. And I have a lot of clients who want to know why their partner cheated but the discussion actually goes round and round in circles. And this is for a variety of different reasons, but generally people end up getting terribly angry. And actually, Caroline had a great way of cutting through this circular argument, which was that no reason that your partner will give you will be good enough for you. And actually, somehow having that as a starting point, and I've actually use this in my counselling room. I've actually got them to listen to the podcast. And when they get into this circle, actually saying, no reason will be good enough for you. I think if we listen to the podcast, and then I'll tell you a bit more about what I thought of it, and I'd be interested to hear if you got anything out of it as well, Michael. Sure. Let's have a listen. Reading your husband tell another woman, I love you, is bad. You know, there's no no getting over that. So also that because there's such this electronic footprint, one, it's so much easier to get caught, honestly. But two, women as a response to the trauma for using the recovery from traumas is the base of this. 
there's so much to look at and look at again and again and again. And I think that they do that, even though it harms them, it sets them back, it doesn't help them. I, I think they think, if well, if I stare and I read every single text message for literally the thousandth time, maybe I will see the why, why, why he did this. You know, because that's what they can't understand is the why. And the great problem is neither will your husband, mm -hmm. because you need a lot of personal insight to understand why. It's the reason why I wrote a book called Why Did I Cheat? Mm -hmm. Because the people who cheat generally cheat because they've actually got no self-knowledge. Mm -hmm. They're not aware of all the material that's churning around inside them that is actually contributing towards that. Mm -hmm. And if you don't understand that, you won't be able to answer the question, why did I cheat? And this is the another one, I don't know if you get this a lot, is how could you have managed to cheat like this? You know, how could you look yourself in the mirror each day and keep going? So the how and the why are the two questions that I get asked the most. Are there big questions you keep on getting asked? Well, it's the why. And the why in the beginning is just a terrible question to ask, even though I know why it's being asked and I don't blame anyone for asking it. But he's going to start telling you the things wrong with you and the marriage. Those are his alibis, but that's not actually the deep reason. That's often the how did I justify to myself to do it? That's the how question, not the why question. hundred percent. And so what I will tell a wife session one is, my work with your husband is going to help him understand the real reason why. Because all of these problems existed in the marriage for you, and you didn't cheat. All the same problems have existed for other people, and they haven't cheated. So, you know, what is the hole, if you will, inside your husband that made this okay? But it doesn't matter what the reason. We'll, we'll work on this, and he will tell you, this is what I discovered with Dr. Caroline, and this is why. It's not going to be satisfying. There will never be a satisfying answer to why. Because no matter what he says, it'll be like, this isn't a good enough reason. And of course, there isn't a good enough reason. And so what I say to a woman is you have to look at him in the eye. Does he understand how he went down this path? Does he understand his triggers? Does it make sense to him how he fell? And then trust that he knows because the why is never going to be satisfying. I think there is something useful about the why because... If you do find out the why, so for example, it's childhood trauma, for example, say, you know, he saw his mother be incredibly hurt. And from that moment onwards, he did everything in his power to make women happy. And he's been doing everything in his power to make you happy. But actually, he's forgotten that he actually has needs as well. And it, he might not want to spend the weekend with your mother, for example. And if he could actually say that, rather than bearing all of that stuff, you could have more honest conversations and there wouldn't be resentment building up. Now, of course, that doesn't justify the reason for having it. But if you want to stay a good marriage, then you need to solve some of the things that are contributing to the underlying issues. And if you don't know what the underlying issues are, you can't have a, a new, better marriage. So I do think the question why can be helpful, but it's not a magic answer for making you feel better. Oh, he did it for this reason. That's useful information, but it's not, it's not the magic answer to feel okay again. Right. It won't be satisfying. You won't hear it and say, Oh, God, now I totally get why you cheated. Yes. Information. And I think that also helps with building empathy, but the therapy has to or coaching has to be in stages. The first one being stop the rolling car help her feel secure in the marriage. Then we can get into why was it that he couldn't communicate with you? Because that is where women can make things difficult for men. You know, we want you to communicate. And then when you do, we're like, not like that. That's not or, what we wanted. And actually, I just want you to communicate nice things. Because, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, communicate with me, tell me stuff. But to be honest, I don't really want to know that somebody's upset that I've left my shoes in the hall yet again. Right. You know, I want the nice things. I'm not so keen on hearing about my mistakes. And, you know, that's natural. But we need to be able to learn to tolerate that stuff. Mm -hmm. So your thoughts, Michael, listening to that again? I think it was a good reminder, or at least I think you can apply a lot of things from what she was saying that I guess helping us understand something or knowing why somebody did something doesn't mean that it makes it okay. It's like, okay, I get it. I know why you did it. I understand. But it doesn't make it, it doesn't justify it. I suppose in, in one way, it's like that's why you may have done it but that doesn't make it okay. Even if I understand why, it's still not okay. 
And it doesn't take away your pain either. And I think sometimes there is a hope that you will finally get an aha moment that all the pain will actually disappear. And I think that's why it's re- useful to actually remember Caroline's statement no reason will be good enough for you. And this is about a thousand and one other things, not just betrayal, that you're hurt by other people. And yes, it helps for empathy, but actually understanding is not going to be the magic bullet that's going to deal with the pain. But um, it's part of the journey. And I think this is the problem sometimes of being a therapist. You can be so deep in therapist thoughts, which is why and how we're going to change this and everything, that actually sometimes you miss these real fundamental truths. And that's why I'm so grateful for Caroline telling me that and reminding me again. So it's right up in my forehead and possibly stamp to write across it that no reason will be good enough for you. And then we cannot go into that churning hole. So it, this isn't going to be good enough, but it actually is going to be helpful for your partner. So this is for him or for her, but once he or she understands the reason, it doesn't actually give a free pass, but it actually helps you on your journey to understanding and changing. So thank you, Caroline, for being a guest and a supporter of The Meaningful Life. I will be forever grateful for that. So what's your first choice, Michael? Okay, so I'm going to try to put them in order that they at least somehow respond to the ones that you've picked. So my first one of my five is Elaine Dundon, Stop Being a Prisoner of Your Thoughts. Mm. And you both spoke a lot about Viktor Frankl and the man's search for meaning. And this is something that I find comes up a lot actually in in many of your episodes and that is that we have the freedom to choose our attitude and although we don't necessarily have control over what happens to us and around us, we do have control over how we respond to that. Mm, Very profound. The core of Viktor Frankl's work, well, his experiences in the camps and in the book Man's Search for Meaning, Maybe we're experiencing things like job losses or financial losses or divorce or health challenges. So no matter what situation we are facing, we always have the ultimate freedom to choose our attitude. So no matter if we think life is happening to us and other people are impacting us, we always have the ability to choose our own reaction to it and our own attitude toward it. Because we can take something horrible happening to us as life's throwing slings and arrows, or we can say, what can I learn from this? And that's a choice, isn't it? Yes, it is. As I circle back, you know, when I was younger, I thought life was a straight line. And I think a lot of us in our younger years think, okay, well, I have my teenage years. I had a lot of fun, maybe. Maybe I had challenges. Maybe I'll go to school, then I'll get a job, and then I'll get married. And then life is a straight line from 30 to 80. And we really, actually, life is not a straight line. And we really need to realize that in resilience is really the whole essence of attitude and how we're going to choose our attitude. So you've called the book that we're talking about Prisoners of Our Thoughts. In what way are we prisoners of our thoughts? I think everyone can answer that in different ways. But first of all, it's the awareness. We always have a smile on our face when we tell people or we share with people that We wrote a book called Prisons of Our Thoughts. And I remember being in an airport and saying to one fellow, well, we wrote a book called Prisoners of Our Thoughts. And he said, my wife could use that. And I thought, (laughs) I thought that is so indicative. It's always someone else who could use this book. So whether it's my spouse or my friend or my sister or my boss or et cetera, someone else can always use this book. Maybe it's really us that could use a book. Give us an example when you've been a prisoner of your thoughts. You've been limited by your thoughts. Oh, I've been limited. (laughs) That would take more than an hour, Andrew. (laughs) Just one example then. I would say in personal relationships is probably the area that I'll say I struggle with and I need to have greater awareness that I have kept people as a prisoner of my thoughts in the fact that I think that they're always going to act or react the way I think they're going to based on my 
view of who they are and who they've been in the past versus realizing that people evolve, people learn, people change the way they approach life. And so I know myself, I'm not the same person I was when I was a teenager or in my 30s or 40s of how I react because I've learned through experiences. And to hold other people prisoner of my thoughts because they've reacted one way 20 years ago doesn't mean they're going to react the same way. And it's amazing how our thoughts can limit us. I'm just thinking at this precise moment of my struggle with learning the German language because I live in Berlin. And I have to stop myself from thinking this is a blooming complicated language. It has so many rules and adjectives have to agree and they decline and prepositions set off what case they're going to. I could talk about this forever. And if I keep on telling myself it's an incredibly difficult language, then I'm handicapping myself. If I can think of it as a beautiful language or having a certain logic to it, then I'm actually less imprisoned with the idea that I'm never going to actually manage this. And yet, you know, this morning I ordered some contact lenses over the telephone and I had some quite complicated questions asked to me and backwards and forwards. And I had a couple of points I needed to make and I did it all with absolutely no problems at all. So, you know, I can do it, (laughs) but I have to be very careful because I can be very easily the prisoner of this idea that German is too complicated for me. Yes. And a lot of what our prison is has to do with our ego and how we also have our self-image of what we should be achieving at a certain time or that things shouldn't be this difficult, etc. Michael, thank you very much for reminding me about that. I mean, I think we all have these scripts in our heads about ourselves and our partners. And it's actually really helpful sometimes to just sort of write down what your core script is. For example, this is a core script I hear a lot from my clients that really provokes a lot of anger and can turn a a very small thing like, what are we going to have for supper, into a nasty argument. And that script is, nothing I do will be enough. And Mm. so something that might be considered by your partner as a joke or a bit of light banter, or maybe even just a question, can be heard through that script, through being a prisoner of your thoughts, as nothing I will do is going to be good enough. And if you can actually meet what your partner is saying with curiosity, you know, why are they saying this? Rather than going automatically into your script, it's maybe even just the sort of taking a deep breath and then reacting rather than just going automatically into the script. But being aware of your scripts, being aware of your thoughts and how they imprison you can really make a huge difference to your life. So thank you for reminding me about that one. Can you think of a a particular time when you've been a prisoner of your thoughts? Off the top of my head. Maybe it is also this kind of, um, I don't know if it's what you call negative self-talk, but when you you assume the way a situation or something is going to be and you don't know that until you go through it. And if you're telling yourself, oh, this isn't going to work or it's not going to be good enough or no one's going to be happy with the result, you're already preempting your reality for what the situation is going to be rather than kind of going into it open and without any expectations and I don't know if I've got an an example off the top of my head, but I think it's maybe a trap that a lot of us sort of fall into. Um, Even coming into this, I was, you know, pacing back and forth thinking, have I prepared enough? Have I got all my ideas, you know, on the top of my mind? Am I going to sound okay? Rather than just going into it freely and openly and just taking it as it comes. Yeah, maybe that's a... (laughs) I was a prisoner of my thoughts this morning. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. And that wasn't one of the ones that I thought might be there, but it's a really good one. And thank you very much, Elaine, for being such a a splendid guest for us. Actually, out of interest, were you surprised by my choices? Not really. I think Carolyn Madden, I knew you would pick. The ones we have coming up, I knew some of them I thought that you would choose. Maybe maybe Philip Carcom. Let's talk about him. Why was that a surprise for you? Maybe because he's the less, I think when you've had more people that are kind of more, let's say, business centric, maybe they haven't left as great an impression on me as when you speak with some of the other people who are, like the other ones for me, I thought that makes sense. Like 
Absolutely. And some of them I was going to pick and I thought, well, I want to choose different people. So, <laughs> so Philip Carbgom is a psychotherapist and a druid. He talked about a poet called Robert Frost, who is famous for a variety of different poems. For example, The Road Less Travelled, which is a very famous self-help book. That title comes from a Robert Frost poem. And he talked about a line from a Robert Frost poem that has stayed with me so much that I've actually started writing a book using this as the title. So the, really? wow. what he talks about is the best way out is through. Yes, exactly. And, and it was reading a, a, a sort of line from Robert Frost, the poet, who said that it was just the way out is the way through. And it just hit me at the right time. Say that again. The way out is the way through. So unpack that for me. Well, yes. I had spent, by that time, I'd probably spent about 10 years trying to get out of running this company. So dinner guests would always be surprised when I offered them the company. I'd say, look, you know, would you like to run a travel company? You know, just give me 20% or something and I'll be quite happy with that. And would you like the travel company or coffee? <laughs> yes, yes. That's right. And absolutely. So I spent about 10 years trying to sort of slip out the back door, I suppose, of trying to sort of offload this company. And then this realization dawned on me that the way out is the way through and that what I should do is I should embrace it and completely engage in it and basically build it up even more to a point where I could sell it successfully. There are various hoops to go through of getting ABTA licenses and IATA licenses and getting the kind of lease on a building where the, you know, the company becomes more valuable because it's got a lease and so on. So I, I went through a, a process that took about three or four years of building it up in a specific way getting more engaged in it in order to then get out successfully, which I did. I sold it to a, a multinational at the end of that process. So let's look at that idea with non-businessy sort of kind of things like emotional things. How can the way out be through in that? Commonly, what we do when we're in a difficult relationship or a difficult exchange, for many of us, is to use the mechanism of denial. So, you know, you just won't listen to the other person. You won't take on board the attack or the perceived attack, the criticism, and dissociate in some ways. And it's very hard to go against this because that's a very natural response to difficulty in interpersonal relationships. But if one can actually engage with the person and with the problem and really listen and really take it on board, and allow oneself to feel the pain that that might bring, then I think the chances of coming through it or resolving it, or if not resolving it... It then, sort of almost becomes a, a joint decision that the relationship can't go any further if you've really talked it through. Hmm. Both of you decide, actually, this is madness. We're not going to make each other happy. Rather than one person sort of unilaterally deciding it, walking out the door and the other person is left saying, hang on, what happened? Why are you going? Hmm. And by going through and really engaging with the problem trying to solve it, but, you know, trying to solve it, you realize just how big the problem is. And neither of you actually have got the energy or the desire to transform that relationship. But you can decide together that maybe this isn't working. Exactly. And that process, which we can talk about so easily together now, is, of course, so difficult in reality. And one of the things that always intrigues me about when I'm hurt, for instance, so if my partner says something that is hurtful or conflictual in some ways, my natural tendency to withdraw is so strong that I find myself in a situation of, of saying to myself, isn't it interesting that you can't even open your mouth to say something? And of course, you learn various techniques like saying something, like, what just happened there? Or, you know, can we just talk about just happened or what happened yesterday, or there are ways that we learn slowly of how to engage with it. But I think we can do that if you take that sort of specific example of a particular exchange and some, sometimes how hard it is even to take that first step. You know, I've found that I, I can say things like, I'm finding it really difficult to even say 
for this now, you know, um, anything just to get to get the conversation going. If one can imagine that sort of process extending to a whole life, and in its extreme, I think many people are stuck in a situation where that sort of thing is happening all the time at work, where they can't even begin to express the dissatisfaction they're having or the problems they're having in uh, with their work and interpersonal relations in work or, or just with their work in general and so on and extend that out to the family relationships in the family with i can see how taking one small interaction so for example my partner and i had a row literally just before this podcast started <laughs> and the tendency will be to put that to one side mm. and try and brush it away because let's be honest, nobody wants to stick with a nasty argument. Mm. But what you're saying is that actually, if we really go through that and get that one solved, it could open up other things that need to be talked about because nearly always arguments are connected to a whole range of other things as well. And you can begin to deal with the bigger picture but you start with it, you go through in a little keyhole rather than trying to put a big lorry through the issue, which is our sort of tendency. We want to sort of drive a big lorry through it, get it solved once and for all. And probably the keyhole is the most that we can manage. Well, exactly. And of course, isn't it interesting that we can take a one interaction like this or a relationship and you know, it gets really quite complex because, of course, although it's the case, that, at least in my experience, the case that Often engaging with an issue and finding a way to talk about it can help. Sometimes it doesn't help. And you could actually, I suppose, play with Robert Frost's idea and say, the way out is sometimes the way round. I mean, sometimes, you know, because the risk, of course, is that it then becomes a confrontation and it becomes bigger than it needs to be. So it's almost like in these situations, I find that the challenge is, or the question is, is this a moment? in which the way out is the way through, and I need to bring up this issue and say, hey, look, can we talk about this? Because what you just said, I found really difficult. Or is this actually a moment where it's best to just leave it because it's like the weather and the cloud is going to go and it'll be better talking about it tomorrow or whatever. So we're always looking for sort of rules. And it's never quite as simple as that because it's a constantly changing picture. So, Michael, which are you? Are you somebody who wants to go through or would you rather go round? I think I've probably been a go around person. (laughs) I'm a bit conflict avoidant, but I'm getting better. (laughs) And actually, if you have something which comes up over and over again, that's probably a time to go through rather than round eventually. And I've got sort of five ideas to help you go through rather than round. And maybe the first one is the most important one, and that is that both of you are right. Even though you see things very differently, from where you're standing, you are right. And it's perfectly possible for two people to both be right. And actually competing for your version of reality to be the ultimate one, or your pain to be more important, actually turns the whole thing actually toxic. So that idea that both of you are right, generally, if you look deeper into the dilemma, and so you go from the shoes in the hallway into something actually deeper rather than just what is the surface thing. So both of you are right. Look deeper into the dilemma. The next one is stay in the crucible of conflict for a bit longer because generally we want to get out and we want to stop this argument. And sometimes just actually staying in it another five minutes or even another 30 seconds, if it's something really difficult, can make a big difference because probably you're coming out at exactly the same point every time and that is actually fueling either your partner's resentment or their anger. The other thing I would do is to stop pushing your solution. So let's go back to the shoes in the hallway. We need to get a cupboard to put them in there. It might be a perfectly good solution, but actually, if you push your solution, you become like the parent and your partner is the child. And that is never a good interaction. Whereas if you actually stay with it long enough, it could be that you'll come up with a, a third solution that will actually be better because you both of you have bought into it rather than one person careering off and buying the shoe cupboard. And my final thought would be find the similarities and build on them. 
So, for example, we both want a a nice house. We both want not to trip over things in the night sort of kind of thing and actually build on those rather than competing for whose solution and whose pain is the greatest. What have you chosen next, Michael? Okay, so my next one is Hannah Martin, How to Believe in Yourself and Start Your Own Business. My gosh, that's a surprise. Tell me about why you chose that one. Part of the reason I chose this one is because she spoke a lot about mothers going back into the workforce and having become a parent this year. And I guess everything that comes with that, I've, maybe some of the episodes that spoke about motherhood, parenting, societal roles and expectations, different aspects of that that kind of cropped up throughout the episodes over this year, maybe stuck with me a bit more than others. So that's why Hannah Martin's episode I've often come back to that one, even thinking having a baby is a pause and then you kind of have time to think and reflect, do I like what I'm doing? Do I want to go back to my job? And there were a few points that I thought I could talk about in this episode, but the one that I want to highlight, it was towards the end of the episode, actually. It was about kind of faking it till you make it or the way that you put it was that you have to dream it before you can do it. In terms of how we see ourselves. There's something I used to do as a teenager that I thought I had magic powers. When I, yes. And when I qualified as a hypnotherapist, I suddenly realized, oh, I've been naturally doing this thing that I do in hypnotherapy with people. So when I was young, I was really shy and really quiet. I had very poor social. I, I have ADHD. So like many girls with ADHD, I, I did, I didn't have social skills, very good social as a child. I didn't have many friends. I really struggled. And I was very short for my age. I said, hand me down clothes. We were poor. I really, I was not the child that anyone aspired to be friends with at school. So I came into my teenage years with this. I didn't know how to, I didn't have friends. I didn't know how to make them. You know, and I had this, I see other women around me or other people around me and think, I wish I was like her. I wish, you know, I was popular and people liked me and I found these things easy. So in my head, I made an alter ego and I had this other character that had a life and she was very like me but she was all the things I wasn't. What was she called? She was called Hannah as well but she had a different surname. So, so she, she was like me but slightly different. You know, in my head she looked like Kate Moss and, and she and she was, you know, very different. But there were still connections to me. You know, she still had my feelings, but she manifested in a wrong different way. And I live with this character. I, she's still alive in my head now. I still still have her. I lived her for years. You know, I spent a lot of time on my own because I didn't have any friends. And, and I would just cycle around the villages I grew up in the country. And in my head, I was living this, this character's life. Every night when I went to bed, I'd fall asleep with these scenarios. And then a really weird thing happened as I hit my late teens and I went to art college and I met other freaks like me. Was that my life? In my life, things that I would dream about in this alternative Hannah's world would come true in my actual life. It obviously, you know, I wasn't Kate Moss and I didn't hang out with rock stars, but I, I did go on tour with well-known, but I, I, you know, I, I, I kind of entered the world. And I, one day I thought, this is really freaky. I wonder I had the power to make things come true. And I, I also changed as well. I started to become much more like the hand. I became more confident. I learned social skills. I started to get friends. I traveled. I did things that were so, that the Hannah that I had grown up with would never have done those things, wanted to but would never have done them. Now, looking back, I was basically rewiring my brain because my brain can't tell the difference between fantasy and reality. And I was just rewiring all those parts of my brain. And I spent long enough imagining I was this Hannah that I actually rewired my brain to become her. And this is what I, when I talk to people now who are lacking in confidence or they don't like some part of themselves, they feel like it's limiting them. And I just say, I used to call it videos. I, I say, make videos in your head. That's what I did. Just create an alternative version of you that's living the life that you want and make it multi-sensory. And when you go to bed at night, create this fantasy world. Anytime, like if you're doing housework or you're driving somewhere, anytime when you're so sort of physically occupied, but your brain is kind of your free thinking, go into this world. And if you do it enough over a period of time that you'll start to notice that you're thinking and feeling differently and that the kind of things that, that this character is experiencing, you can experience too. And I think that is so important. You have to dream it before you can actually do it. And people actually stop the film before it's even got going. We do the opposite. We, we catastrophize. 
So it's the opposite to that. So actually, we turn the dream into a nightmare. Yeah. So we think, you know, no one likes me. And then I go into, I'm never going to get anything at work. This is the classic thing is public speaking. So if you are treating, working with someone to public speaking, what it tends to do is they've got to do a big talk to their company. Oh, no, I'm going to walk on stage. No one's going to laugh at my jokes. I'm not going to know what to say. And they kind of create this video in their head of the experience that it's going to be with all their worst fears. And they're doing the opposite. They're rewiring their brain, but in the worst possible way. So of course, when they do go and stand on that stage, they're kind of bringing all that negativity there. And they're kind of almost guessing, oh, this joke's going to bomb. So they read it in a really poor way. It does bomb. Then it kind of reinforces all their fears, which anyway, they carry on. So what we tend to do is we tend to go down these rabbit holes of the worst thinking. And the thing is with that is that it's quite comfortable to think that, especially if you can get a sort of self-pitying kind of thing going. It, it does feel quite, you know, well, of course, my boyfriend's going to cheat on me because everyone else has. And then I'm going to find, you know, like he's going to leave me and then I'm never going to get another boyfriend again. And I'm going to die in a maid with cats. And, and we, te- we do that. And of course, that's rewiring our brain to expect that, to act in a way that's going to man- somehow, you know, manifest that, make choices that are going to lead to that outcome. Or we're going to sabotage our relationship because of course he's going to cheat on us. So we're going to look for evidence of cheating or we're going to keep him at arm's length because we're going to fear he's cheating. So he doesn't feel connected to us and maybe he does cheat. So what you know, we tend to is the opposite. So we all have a choice. Wow. I'd forgotten all about that. It's, it's, I think. The thing that I'm immediately becoming aware of is that sometimes the titles of the programmes are a little bit misleading because actually, if you're not interested in starting your own business, why listen to that episode? But Mm. there is something about people talking about what makes their life meaningful, that we're going a certain depth in, even if you don't want to start your own business, there is a huge amount of wisdom that you can get from that person. And I think that's, you know, one of the joys of talking to all these people and talking to them in in depth and going down, but also having enough time as well, that you find some really brilliant ideas. And I'd forgotten about that idea of, you know, creating your avatar of a, a, a better or the type of person you want to be and the danger of actually creating a negative avatar that also becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Do you have an avatar now, Michael? I don't have an avatar, but I think I do at least try to approach things with a more positive outlook rather than thinking I can't do something. Think of it more that well, I can do that or I can at least have a go and then see what happens. Well, it rather moves us nicely on to my next choice, which yours is about the benefits of the positive. This choice is Lisa Marciano, who's a Jungian therapist and one of the people from This Jungian Life, which is a podcast I always recommend. And she's talking about looking at the shadow side. The negatives are so-called negatives that we don't want to own. Now, as she was talking about motherhood, I thought that if I hadn't have stolen this one, you might have chosen this one. Am I, no, I, am I right? This one. Yes, yeah, this was going to be one of mine. <laughs> I think she will explain for us what the shadow is, but basically the central idea, it's the parts of ourselves we try not to own and we spot in other people and police in them. So if you don't want to own your thoughtlessness, you immediately find lots of people around you who are thoughtless and then attack them for being thoughtless. And then you can say, there's no flies on me because I'm not like that horrible thoughtless person over there. But actually re-owning our unpossessed parts of ourselves is actually very powerful. I have a whole chapter in the book on rage. I think you need one, maybe two chapters. Well, there's three chapters about sort of the shadow and one of those is about rage in particular. My favorite quote on motherhood is the novelist Faye Weldon said, the nicest thing, this may be a paraphrase, the best thing about not having children is that you can go on thinking that you're a good person. (laughs) Uh, Faye Weldon has had children, so she knows that's not the case. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I, (laughs) the thing about kids is, as someone once put it, it's the alwaysness of it. I mean, Mm. you, you have a cat maybe and you, you know, or a puppy, 
But, you know, you can put the puppy in his crate. You should put the puppy in its crate. It needs a rest. Yeah. Or you can, you know, drop the puppy off with a, you know, puppy caregiver over the weekend. I mean, you just can't, unless you've done it, it's hard to fathom just the physical demands of having a child that, you know, they can wake up at any time of the night and you've got to go deal with it. No matter, it doesn't matter how tired you are, how sick you are. I remember my daughter when she was, I don't know, a year and a half or something, she got rotavirus. And, you know, when your kid gets rotavirus, guess what? You get rotavirus. We renamed it the death come take me now virus in my household because it, you just want to die. It's horrible. And it didn't matter that I couldn't stand up without vomiting. I still had to take care of her. You know, it was just asking where the rage comes from. I, I think partly it's just that we're actually just pushed to our limit. Right. A lot of the time we're exhausted There's sort of no time. Once they talk, you can't even have your own thought because they're always talking. So you can't even just be in your own head, you know, and it's the intensity of it. I think if there's any capacity for rage and there's capacity for rage in all of us, you're going to experience that. And this is partly why it's a real opportunity for psychological growth, because you may have thought, oh, I, you know, I'm not capable of rage. I'm not capable of sadism. I would never be rough with a child. Well, guess what? (laughs) I think most mothers, if they're being honest, are going to admit that they had moments of just cross-eyed rage probably every day. So what do you do with this rage? We First of all, we've accepted that it's perfectly normal. It's natural. It's human. And fairy tales are full of murderous witches that are going to eat Hansel and Gretel and everybody else. So it's perfectly normal. It's okay. What's the next thing we do with it? There's a great fairy tale that I use in the book to talk about rage. And it's called The Horned Women. It's an Irish fairy tale. And it's about this woman who's up late at night working and there's a knock at the door. And one by one, these witches come in. They have the first witch has one horn. The second witch has two horns and on like that. And there's 12 of them. Ooh! She can't cry out. She has to do their bidding. And they make her drain the children's blood and make a cake. <laughs> yeah, it's really... Really dark. Can't see the Disney version of this any day soon. <laughs> No, I don't think that's on their list. But she gets help from the spirit of the well. They tell her to go get water. And so she's down at the well and the well helps her. And wells in Ireland are sacred places. They're portals to the realm of the sacred feminine. And so there's a lot of kind of numinosity and wisdom there. And with the advice from the well, she's able to banish the witches. And it involves several things. It involves actually feeding some of that cake to her children, which I think says something about sort of metabolizing our rage and then being able to basically apologize. And, you know, people who research infant attachment talk about the importance of repair. It's not really so much about never getting angry at your kids as it is about being able to effect a good repair. So if you get angry and you really lose it, the important thing is when you've calmed down a little bit to go back and really make a good repair that probably is an apology and maybe an explanation about, you know, here's what was happening for me. Not, you made me get so angry, but, you know, I'm I'm so sorry that I yelled at you. I shouldn't have done that. I've been feeling really tired and, you know, I'll, I'll try to do better, knowing that she'll probably screw up again, but you're, you're thinking about it. And I'm interested in the well, because uh, the well is very deep, isn't it? And mm-hmm. the answers are coming from actually quite deep inside us. Yes. And so there does seem to need to be some sort of contemplation, possibly about your history when it comes to rage. You know, what mm-hmm. was your mother's relationship to rage and your grandmother's relationship to rage? I think that would be quite interesting to explore. I, I really, really like that. I think that that's a perfect kind of extension of the amplification. And Jung actually had sort of a, a thought about apologies, which is what really matters is that you do exactly what you're talking about. When you've made a mistake, that you take it in and you think really hard about what was going on for me? Why did this happen? Why did I get so provoked by him having a meltdown about there not being enough syrup on the pancake? Because it's probably about something extra, because mm-hmm. this has got a, an extra force to it. Yes. It's, you know, there's something about, I don't know, not providing or not being perfect or something that mm-hmm. is hooking you in on. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think that's really good. 
So yeah, so there's contemplation, there's listening to our own deep wisdom, there's being able to in effect or repair. But the the spirit of the well also tells her you have to bar the door. Right. There are these sort of intrapsychic things that we have to do, but then there may be some practices that we need to try to incorporate to just build up a strong enough ego so that we don't we're not constantly lashing out on our kids that we're we're not letting all these random thoughts come in because you know the internet is like a door that is you know we're forever opening and letting all these witches in aren't we yes yeah that's that's a great image yeah that's the internet (laughs) so your thoughts as a parent michael Well, I mean, personally, I've not had this kind of bubbling up rage yet. I'm sure it'll happen. But I guess that whole episode, I think, resonated a lot with me. And I think I like the point about not being a parent and believing that you're not capable of certain emotions. Because until you're kind of faced with that, I think the, how does she put it, the alwaysness of being a parent, like you can't escape it. And I kind of remember speaking about this maybe briefly when you interviewed my wife and I that you don't have the option anymore to check out like you have to be there they need you 100% of the time you always have to be available and you have to be ready and it doesn't matter if you're tired or if you're sick you just have to be there and it's a different kind of demand than anything else and I think the other thing that I've taken on is not only to accept the bits that are unacceptable, because the further we push them away, the more likely they are to leap out from behind the door and grab us, is just the power of myths, that these stories have been around for forever, because they actually speak to some ancient truths. And sometimes actually approaching a problem through the story is a different way of actually looking at something that's going on. And so those stories and those myths are really useful. And I've actually worked with some of my clients where we've actually gone through the stories in the book that um, Lisa has, and she has a whole load of questions to ask yourself at the end of each chapter. And we've gone through those together, and they're really powerful. And I really recommend that book. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. So what have you got next for us then, Michael? <laughs> well, it's, it's probably not a surprise that I'm going to now go into Philip Perry. Who that is... <laughs> was one of my thoughts that you would go for that one. Yeah, I think like Lisa Marciano, Philippa was brilliant and I'm very honoured to have been amongst those three <laughs> speakers for talking about parenthood. But her episode, What You Wish Your Parents Knew and What Your Children Hope You Learn, taken from the title of her book, I've already taken on a few of the things actually that she discussed in the episode and well, we'll play the clip and then we can talk a bit more about it. I do believe strongly in trying to find the words for feelings now, because I think if we don't find the words for our feelings, we don't become the boss of our feelings. They become the boss of us. So when Mm. we find the words for our feelings, then we can contain them. And I think it really helps when you're a parent as well, if you can help to put your child's feelings, a bit like a therapist might have a go at, into words too. So, you know, when the kid is kicking off, it's quite useful to say, you are so angry about that. Because then they learn that they can verbalise what they're feeling so they don't have to throw the bricks against the wall or whatever it is they're doing. And eventually they learn to put their feelings into words, which helps them to own them and process them and not be overwhelmed by them. So they learn how to manage feelings. I can remember when my daughter was about four and I'd been, I'd I'd been doing this because I sort of believed in it, but I didn't have any proof for it at all. But I remember when my daughter was about four, she said to me, I'm going to get very angry in a minute. And I thought, yes, we're making great progress here. And I can remember saying to her, yes, that's very annoying, isn't it? So I validated the feeling sort of like, yes, it really is. And then no tantrum, just being able to express it and say it and keep in control, but feel heard and validated. And it's like, oh, 
that was a good day. <laughs> and it's interesting, this, because one of the main jobs of a parent is helping small children who don't know how to, to contain their feelings, but without denying them. Yes, that's so important. It's such a difficult balance. Any thoughts about how to do that? It's, it is a difficult balance because what a parent very naturally often says is, don't be sad, darling, we're going to go to the zoo on the weekend, rather than going... Yes, it is sad that mummy has to be away for the night at work and you've only got me to look after you. What can we do about that? It's very sad. Rather than, don't be sad, we're going to have such fun. It's sort of like giving you the message that you're not allowed to be sad if you say, don't be sad. It's giving you the message that you're not acceptable when you are sad. Now, I've had many clients who had lovely, well-meaning parents who felt they were unacceptable when they were sad. So they push that sadness down. They don't learn how to express it. They don't learn how to put it into words. And before you know where you are, you've got someone with depression because they've got this free floating anxiety or sadness or something that they've never learned to articulate. And if they have tried to articulate, it hasn't been validated. It's been, but we're going to the zoo on Friday or whatever it is. So that you know, it gets pushed back again. So you don't want to repress the feelings. You don't want to distract from the feelings. And the other thing you don't want to do is overreact to them either. That's right. And magnify them. No, that's right. So if your kid goes, I've cut my finger, you don't want to go, ah, we've got to go to hospital. I can't bear this much of blood. You know, that's really not going to help either. We need to get into this, what I call containing space. So we say things like, Oh, you are angry, aren't you? How about drawing that on this bit of paper about how angry you are? Or, yes, it's really sad your friends are going away and you will feel very sad for a while until that gap is filled by new friends. But it might take some while and in the meantime, you're going to feel sad and that's okay. What would you like to do? Yeah, but it's amazing how often you get bought off. The minute you were talking about that, I was remembering when um, the next door neighbours, when I was mm, about four or five, they were like an honorary aunt and uncle and they yeah. moved away and they bought me a present to try and deal with the pain. And it's, yeah. it's amazing how you try and buy off children when really all they want is you to acknowledge their feelings. Yeah. It's okay to be sad when auntie and uncle go away and aren't coming back, but a sadness is a very appropriate thing to feel. And what we learn if we're not frightened of sadness like that is that it is tolerable because sadness is a part of life. So, you know, we have to learn to tolerate it. Your comments, Michael? I just think what you pointed out is extremely valuable and super useful as a parent. And I think as a human being, that's identifying feelings, understanding them, and in a sense, owning them is a better way of dealing with them rather than, I guess, avoiding them, repressing them, letting them kind of manifest deep inside and come out in other ways. I think the points that she was making about not amplifying the feelings as well was really good because like when our little girl, if she falls over or if she does something, be like, oh, are you okay? Or, oh, it's fine. Or how are you? Not go, oh my goodness, are you falling over? And like make a big deal out of it because thinking about how we're, I guess, conditioned as children or how we grow up. We don't know how to respond to things. We're taught how to respond to them. And if if every little thing is somehow the end of the world, then when you're growing up, anything that goes bad is a disaster rather than just thinking, oh, okay, I, I fell over and hurt my knee. It's not the end of the world. I can keep on going rather than thinking, oh, now I need to go to hospital and now I need everybody to come around and help me. And, oh, you poor thing, let's go buy you something new to help make it better for you. It's like, that's okay. And like she said at the end of it, like sadness is a part of life. And the earlier we learn that, the better equipped we are going to be throughout life to deal with that rather than, I don't know, when you get to university or when you get to work and then you realize, oh, you mean everything doesn't go my way all the time? You know, you're not going to be able to handle it then. You're going to be a lot better equipped if you can deal with that when you're three or four than when you're 23 or 24. And getting that balance right is so difficult because you don't want to panic 
when there's a they've fallen over, but you don't want to have the sort of oh you know my limb is broken, but I'm going to co- soldier on because it's just no, stuff and nonsense <laughs> sort of kind of uh, element. I I've had, very much had that kind of upbringing that you know you didn't go to hospital unless you had a, a broken limb kind of thing. And so I'm afraid to say I'm very bad at going to the doctors. I have to be bullied to go to the doctor. So you can get one of two ways, but um, finding the middle sweet spot is really difficult. And that's why it was really useful to have uh, Philippa's wisdom. Actually, on facing difficult things, it brings us through to Dr. Catherine Mannix, who's a palliative care doctor and author of With the End in Mind. And she talks about the importance of talking about death without shying away. Hearing him have that conversation was the first time I heard it. And I'd been through medical school and I realise now being trained to save lives seeing death as a thing that we need to avoid at all costs. And the idea of bedside companionship for people who are inevitably dying and tailoring their experience so that it's the least uncomfortable for them that it can be. And that's really very specific. Some people would rather be more sleepy. Some people will tolerate lots of symptoms to remain as clear-minded as they possibly can. So it's not what we think is the best death. It's what they tell us is the best death. Again, how will you know that if you don't have that conversation? So that experience was a complete game changer for me that completely opened my eyes to a different way of being in the presence of the idea of dying as well as being in the presence of death. So you weren't afraid of death. This is what you say. You were in awe of it. Can you tell me what you mean by that? I'd had a little bit of a crisis during medical school when I first got onto the wards and realised that the people who had the relationship with patients that I had hoped I was going to have were not the doctors, but were the (laughs) nurses. I'm going to tell you a story about that later, but carry on. So I found myself very distressed that the relationships that medical students can have with their patients is quite close because we've got lots of time and we're not rushing from one person to another. But then seeing people who I'd clerked in to practice clerking on a hematology board where in, you know, the early 1980s, treatments for leukemias were not nearly as good as they are now. So many of these people I got to know quite well over a period of weeks to a few months. And that would be from presentation to death for those people. And the nurses were really kind to me and brought me in alongside when they were looking after my patients who were dying, who were not, of course, my patients at all because I was only a student. But they realized that I wanted to be able to make a contribution to their care. And so what they taught me was how to be with people, whereas what medicine was teaching me was how to do things to people. And it meant that I was able to be alongside people's care during their dying in and out of the room, you know, not mistaking myself for an important member of their family, but able to be witnessing the process as it evolved, which was another thing that was coming back to me when I was listening to the conversation with Simone. Yes, I have seen this. I have seen this. And that moment of transformation from alive to not alive anymore always seemed to me to be an awesome thing. What is it about us that changes? What is it that means there is a person here and then the person is absent? And it didn't seem to me to be frightening. It seemed to me to be something to postpone until as late on in my own life as I possibly could. I don't mean I was kind of, I I developed a death wish, but the idea that dying is frightening, I'd already realized that it need not be. But I have never, ever got past that sense of awe of being in a room as somebody actually dies. I had that experience when I was in my late 30s. My uh, partner was dying and it was terribly obvious. In fact, it was here in Germany because my partner was German. And when he was ill, he went back to Germany. And the doctor told me, sometimes when we stop treating people, they get better. And I sort of looked at him as if, he took me for a fool because 
And so it was not only was it impossible to have that conversation and there was nothing explained to me, but it was actually left up to a nurse a couple of days later to say, look, I think we're coming towards the end now. And so, you know, if you want to tell his family and all those other things, and I could then invite these people round. Without that, I wouldn't have known. And in fact, after my partner died, and I went back the next day to collect a few things from the hospital room. I saw the doctor further down the hallway and he deliberately turned away and went the opposite direction from me because he was frightened. I don't know what of, but it wasn't a very human response. You know, you could have just even nodded at me rather than turning away. That was in the nineties. And this was in what was called an anthroposophical hospital. So they were much more interested in treating the whole person, but yet they still couldn't have those conversations. I mean, it is quite shocking, really, isn't it? It is shocking. And yet somehow we've lost some of the apprenticeship from medicine. Medicine's become about knowledge, about knowledge acquisition and practical skills. But the practical skill of communicating I think is in danger of drifting. And I think that I could not have learned how to talk about dying by reading it in a textbook. At the very least, I would have needed a video of a master practitioner in action. But actually to sit at that bedside, to literally, as I now reflect on it, sit at their feet Mm -hmm. and have nothing to offer but attention, you know, to be humbled by the idea of death, I think is part of then being able to talk about it. It's not an enemy. It's not an opponent. It simply is. And we are mortal. And can we talk about that? Wow. I mean, that is just so moving to hear her speak again. We have a a bit of a treat because next week, Dr. Catherine Mannix returns And we're going to be talking about how to listen, really listen. So that's next week's podcast. So um, do listen to that. What are your thoughts, Michael, hearing her speak? I think editing that and listening to it again, I was teary. Like it was a heavy episode to listen to and just to, I guess, contemplate life, how it's fragile, how it's we have limited time and that we're, we're not nearly well enough equipped to, to deal with it when we have to face it. So, yeah, it was, um, it was a hard one to listen to. And even when you do spend half your life thinking about death and talking to people like Dr. Catherine Mannix, it sort of doesn't make bereavement any easier because about 10 days ago, I got the news that my father had uh, died. And... You know, I've been just surprised by the depth of the feelings that that has brought up. You know, I thought I've done this death thing before. You know, I Mm. lost my partner when I was quite young. My mother died about five years ago. My father was 91. So I've had time to sort of prepare myself for that. But you can't prepare yourself for it. It always still is a shock. Even when yeah. somebody's 91 years old, it is still a shock. And what I've sort of noticed is how difficult it is to be alongside that pain, both for other people approaching me. They sort of want to say things like, it's what he wanted and he didn't suffer and it was quick. They sort of want to offer reassurance And I find it quite difficult myself to sit beside my Mm. own pain. You know, I want to sort of brush it away and get on with it. And, you know, I've got things to do. Um, And it's very difficult to be alongside our pain and alongside other people's pain. I mean, this is something that Catherine talks a lot about in the forthcoming podcast. So I'd recommend listening to that as well. But... We just do not talk enough about death. Sort of even on a podcast called The Meaningful Life, how often do I actually talk about death? Mm. Not that often, really. I have a more than a sneaking suspicion. We've got quite a few episodes <laughs> about grief and loss and everything coming up. So please be uh, patient with me. But I think we, not only I, but we all have lots of... Um, 
grief that has been unprocessed that is just sticking around that we need to face. Yeah, absolutely. So let's move on to our next choice, which is from you. What have you chosen? I guess we're talking about difficult life stages and difficult periods of this meaningful life that we're having. So I really quite enjoyed Eleanor Mills' How to Reinvent Yourself at 50. I think she was a great guest that you had, and I really enjoyed listening to her episode. And one of the lessons I think that I've taken away from it is how it's okay to not be okay. And a close friend of mine actually is going through something similar to what Eleanor went through. And, you know, if you're a manager or a CEO, you're always kind of putting up this front of, I'm in control, I have the power. But it's okay to ask for help and to tell other people, you know what, it really sucks right now and I'm not doing that well and I need <laughs> I need a bit of support. One of your friends on a walk said, you know, how are you? Were you able to tell them that you weren't coping? Because, you know, you come across as a very strong, confident person. And I'm just wondering whether it was difficult to actually say, I'm in a bad place. I need help rather than being the person that's raising £300,000 for other people. I need help myself. Was that something that was quite difficult and actually against a little bit of your self-image? Yeah, it was horrible, Andrew. I hated it. Everything in my life has been about projecting front. It's funny, I had a conversation on Facebook about exactly this with an old friend who I was at Westminster with. He was probably had the most front of any boy I'd ever met. And we were talking about kind of dropping that guard and he was saying that he'd had to do it too. No, it was really, really hard for me. My friend said, are you all right? And I burst into tears and I was like, actually, I'm so not right. I feel awful sad, miserable, hopeless, like it's not going to get better. And just admitting that, it's a huge relief. It's like the damn burst. It was very funny. We were sitting on the corner from my house in Kentishtown. It was about midday on a Monday, drinking pims out of a tin like a pair of <laughs> trans. <laughs> but it was actually a really good moment because I think there's such a kind of like, oh yeah, no, it's fine and I'm doing this and da da da. But actually I found that being able to be vulnerable to say, actually, I'm really not okay and I don't really know how to deal with this because it's not really me was actually very freeing. And I also found that people were very kind. And I think sometimes it's easier to be friends with someone if they're in a bit of a low state, because you feel very kind of needed. And I think particularly, because I usually am quite confident, and I'm quite well defended, and I can be quite kind of feisty. To have me kind of pathetic and weepy and needy was quite a surprise to quite a lot of people. And they were actually really sweet to me. I kind of discovered that there's a real strength and vulnerability. And then I was very reluctant to write about it. I mean, it was a really horrible thing to kind of admit. I talked to my friend Decca Aikenhead, whose husband died, and she wrote an amazing memoir about losing him and how awful she felt. Mm. And just before I wrote this very raw piece, which I did for The Telegraph, about what it was like to kind of feel like you were on the scrap heap at 50, I said, I've written this thing. And she said, darling, it's like running outside kind of wearing no knickers. But what you have to remember, and it feels really, really makes you feel very vulnerable. But she said, what you have to remember is if you go out and you do that, everyone will come to you. That Actually, everybody feels like that. And by sharing something which is very true, you massively touch a nerve. And she was completely right, because I don't think anything I've ever written has had such an effect. I had thousands of emails and people getting in touch on LinkedIn saying, thank you for expressing how I feel. I felt so shamed that this is how I felt. I felt so washed up. I felt like I was never going to amount to anything again. And I think the sharing of the vulnerability, but also an optimism that you can come from that point and that things will get better has been, I think, one of the most powerful things we've done on Noon. And actually, the very first interview I did on IGTV, I mean, I've had to learn all sorts of weird things. I've never done an IGTV live before. It's an Instagram live and all these kind of weird bits of social media. But I did an interview with Raina Wynn, who wrote that book, Salt Path, which is, I think, maybe the redemptive tale of midlife. Her husband was diagnosed with a terminal illness. They lost their house because of some awful legal thing. They were homeless. They had absolutely nowhere to go. And they set off to walk the Southwest Coast Pass and they walked all the way around Cornwall. And the physical activity made him much better. And just being in the moment and being in nature and seeing the sea every day, they kind of healed themselves. And by the time they got to the end of the path, they kind of had a plan. A friend had lent them a house. Then she wrote this book about it, which has become a huge bestseller. And so there was something redemptive in deciding to walk and not just giving up and going to live in a council flat, but to go on this adventure. 
I love that. I love that sense of you can have some agency by immersing yourself in a project, even if it's just a walk, you can reinvent yourself. And I think we're all going to live for a long time. So that process of reinvention and what that really feels like, how sad it is, how vulnerable you feel, how you have to strip yourself back and chop off bits that you found very precious and show things that maybe you hadn't revealed before. All of that is a strengthening process, actually, and that you come out of that feeling renewed and restored and having found maybe a new tribe of people. I really feel like that and some new beliefs and some new things and actually feeling happier and excited. I mean, every day now I do about 10 things I've never done before. It is wonderful to hear these people again. Thank you very much, Eleanor, for also being a great guest. And I think that one of the great wonders of this podcast is how much people open themselves up and how much they share vulnerability and she's right. You know, if you run out into the streets with no knickers on, other people will recognise that vulnerability and will share their vulnerability. And it makes the world a better place. We all feel a little less alone with our particular corner of it. Mm -hmm. I think what was also interesting, or I guess reassuring, is how she said that people around her were really supportive. And the friend of mine that's going through a similar let's say a rough patch, has had the same response, actually. They said like a lot of their friends and colleagues have also said, oh, you know, I've been through something similar. It's okay. Like, we're here for you. And they thought, oh, people are going to see me as weak now. But it, it has been a really, like, people have kind of warmed up to them and said, no, no, look, it's good. Like, we can help you. It's fine. We're in this together. So it's reassuring. So it brings me around to my final guest that I want to return to. And what did I learn from James Hollis, the Jungian therapist? I think everybody who listens to this podcast knows that uh, I recommend his books all the time because he just brings a huge amount of wisdom. So why did I choose this particular clip? I think that maybe we'll listen to it and then I will explain. So does resilience look different at 80 than it might have done when you were 40? Yes, I'm 81 now. I spent most of 2020 not only dealing with the pandemic, but with two different cancers. Went through multiple surgeries, radiation, chemo, infusion, uh, suppression shots, et cetera, et cetera. And during that time, I wrote two more books, saw my patients the whole time. I was getting up at 5 a.m. to have radiation at 7 in order to be back by 9 o'clock to uh, start my day. And it wasn't that I was being heroic. I was being very selfish. What I was wanting to do was retain as much of the life I value as I could under the circumstances. And so the motto that I adopted for myself during that time was militant submission, a deliberate oxymoron. I was submitting to the body, which is, after all, part of who we are. I was submitting to the medical regimen and the interruptions to my life, my schedule, and so forth. But I was militant about it. I was going to stay as active as I could manage, not in denial, but in respectful relationship to the need to take care of the body. And I look upon that as one of those many things that we get through. Now, I would have probably seen it quite differently at 40. You're right. I guess at 81, I'm used to getting through more things now than I was even then. Do you think there's more patience at 80 than 40? Certainly. I think the two most difficult things I've ever learned as a therapist and as a human being, I still despise, and that is patience and powerlessness. And you know, as a therapist, we often have to sit and hold something for a very long time with our clients. And yet, somehow, something tends to come through out of that relationship, out of that holding, out of that focus of of energies. And when we do that, we realize, again, something within that person has been supporting that process that rises to to help them. So patience and powerless are are not uh, virtues in my estimation, but they're necessarily survival mechanisms, that's for sure. So what did you learn about patience from being a patient Well, I learned, for example, while I was waiting for radiation, I was sitting with a lot of other folks waiting for the same thing, all of whom were at various stages of health. 
And everybody was looking at the floor. Nobody would look at anybody else. And I realized why. It was not only a frightening experience for them. In some profound way, they felt almost ashamed by their vulnerability, I suppose. So I'm an introvert. And yet I felt at that point a, a deep need for connection with those folks. I guess I couldn't stop being a therapist even there. But I started asking simple questions like, do you have a long way to drive to get here? And that was such an innocuous question, began to open things up. And I made a point of sometimes bringing a joke and so forth. Not something frivolous, but in time, a certain sense of camaraderie, even community arose out of the folks, because we all tended to be there at a certain time of day. And of course, people were coming and going as they finished their treatment or entering and, and so forth. And I spent my time getting to know the technicians as they're doing their work. And I wouldn't say that was typical of me, because as I said, I'm an introvert. I tend to keep my mouth shut in the presence of strangers. But to me, it felt important to take a stand in the face of the fears that people were facing. Uh, I didn't find myself afraid. I, I've accepted my mortality a long time ago. I, I've actually been living, I think, on borrowed time. And I'm grateful for that time. My, my biggest fear of death is not wanting to leave my wife, frankly, who is 80 and will need my help from time to time, as well as companionship. I'm still curious. I still have things I want to know about and to learn. I've just finished the manuscript of another book. And during this time, it's been a very rich experience for me because one of the beauties of mortality is it reminds us that we're here a very short time. I have a friend, Oliver Berkman, who's an Englishman, by the way, who just published a book called 4,000 Weeks, in which he said, if you live to 80, that's what you get, 4,000 weeks. It's not that long when you think about it. All of humankind, as we know it, has been a little over 300,000 weeks. So we, we, we realize that mortality is that which makes life meaningful, because it requires then for me to make choices, knowing that I can't just do this for a century, and then I can do something else for a century, then do something else for a century, then life would lose its savor. It's because our choices matter, our values matter, that we are able to live a richer life. And I can't imagine at this point in my life living a richer life than I'm living now, because I'm privileged to spend this part of my journey with folks in difficult times in their lives. To be invited to that conversation is such a privilege. I'm in good relationship with my partner. I'm still growing and learning. And we all know there are difficulties in this world that we need to address. So what more could we ask for in life? What an inspiration that man is. I mean, the reason I chose it, him talking about patience and the importance of actually sitting with stuff and being patient and accepting our powerlessness sometimes. And actually, as a therapist, it's good to remember that because if you do, then there's more space for your clients to find the powerful place in themselves and generate the help that they need from inside, which is always going to be better than something being handed to them. So, I mean, I chose it because of um, patience. But, you know, this idea of militant submission and accepting how things are is also another powerful idea. Something that you don't get on the the podcast, but is a, another thing that James does without really thinking about it, which is very powerful, is something called blessing. And we sort of think as we get older, we have got less to offer. But one of the things that older people do have to offer is a blessing. And that is really powerful. We had so much great feedback on this episode. And I sent some of it to James to say, you know, thank you for being on the podcast. This is what, you know, some of the people listening to it had to say about it. And he wrote back and said, thank you. And just told me what a, a valuable thing that this podcast is. And it was just a blessing. And it was given so freely with, you know, no strings attached. And we sort of need blessings in our lives. And it sort of reminded me that we can bless people, you know, and that that is something that is 
really wonderful by just showing what we appreciate at them. That is giving them a blessing. Thank you for ABC. You know, thank you for being a, a really good producer over the last year and helping this podcast find a shape rather than me just rattling on for hours and hours on end. Well, I mean, thank you for having me as part of the project. It has also been a real treat, I think, to be part of the program because I could be producing a program about cars or something that I'm not interested in. And just to have the insight and the wisdom from your guests every week is, yeah, that's a real gift. So thank you, Andrew. So what was your last choice? I don't know if you'd guessed this one, but I think it's also quite appropriate following on from what James Hollis was saying. And I had picked Chester Elton, How Gratitude Can Revolutionise Your Life. Ah, oh, right. I thought you were going to choose Tracy McCubbin, who spoke about um, throwing out things and uh, decluttering, oh, okay, yeah. because you're about to travel off to Australia. So I think you've probably <laughs> got a lot of decluttering to do. But yeah, I do. What, what, what was it about Chester that spoke to you? I mean, his positivity was a bit infectious. And I think sometimes when people are that positive, you can kind of be a bit dismissive of it and think, oh, how can you be so happy all the time with everything? But he just had such a way of seeing the world and I guess being grateful for what he had. And when I had the clip earlier, when Hannah was Hannah Martin was talking about, you know, imagining the person that you want to be and you rewire your brain. And there's another popular podcaster and neuroscientist, Dr. Andrew Huberman, who also talks about rewiring our brains through gratitude and that a lot of people that regularly practice gratitude have a more fulfilling life because they realize, yeah, like I've got, I have a place to live. I have good friends. I have good food every day. I have an interesting job or whatever that it is, even if it's just really little things like being grateful for what you do have rather than wondering or wishing for things that you don't. It affects how you view everything. And I just think in general, how he talks about having gratitude and how important it is. And I've I'm trying to do it more, to write it down at least each day, like in the morning, write down, oh, I'm grateful for this, or at the end of the day, you know, this happened today, this was really good. And having that more positive mindset rather than thinking, oh, I didn't get enough done, or I could have done more, or this wasn't good enough. Rather than thinking like that and ending the day on a low, think, oh, well, you know, all of these things happened, today was a good day. Because I think there's almost two ways of looking at the world. There's a way of looking at the world that there is abundance and that you'll get what you need. And then there's another way of looking at the world that it's a world of scarcity and you have to hold on to everything you've got because it's going to be taken away from you. And that very fundamental attitude is going to affect how you respond to gratitude, isn't it? Uh, no question. If you have an abundance mentality, giving gratitude and expressing gratitude becomes very easy. If you are of a scarcity mentality, you hold everything close. And I mean everything, not just your money and your resources, your emotions, your friendship, your service. And uh, your world becomes very small when you have a scarcity mentality. When you have an abundance mentality, and I would say a spirit of gratitude, the world opens up and becomes a marvelous place of friendship and engagement and opportunity. And so if somebody is suddenly thinking, oh, actually, I think I've most probably got the scarcity rather than the abundance way of looking at the world. Have you got any suggestions of how they might challenge that scarcity? I do. Some simple little things. I, I love tradition. You know, I, I love that you can set up triggers, I like to call them, that remind you of how fortunate you are. My wife is wonderful about this. Depending on the season, she'll decorate in a meaningful way. We've, we've got simple uh, traditions at the dinner table. For example, when we have the kids over, we say, look, there are three questions you need to answer at the dinner table. One is to tell us about the best part of your day. So again, that abundance mentality, I've had something good happens, hopefully, in every day. Two, tell us about someone you're grateful for who's not at the table. And thirdly, express your gratitude for somebody at the table who hasn't been thanked yet. And it creates this wonderful abundance of, of giving. You know, you get to talk about your day. You get to talk about somebody that helped you during the day at work or at school. And, and you get to express your gratitude for someone at the table. I love that trigger. We have a tradition, my wife and I, at the end of the day, we say, no matter where we are in the world, we, we try to connect. And we say, what are your three? And we say, 
what are three things you're grateful for today? And you know what's really wonderful is it's often more than three things. You start to think about your day, an interaction you had, and you know, we've got two wonderful grandkids that live three blocks away. We see them all the time. And, and it's, it's a lovely way to end the day. Now, research has shown that when you end your day with that kind of thought pattern, the stimuli and whatnot helps you to relax. It lowers your anxiety. It, you'll, you'll sleep a little better. Your, your, your relationships become a little deeper because you're not beating yourself up on all the things you did wrong. You know, let's face it as, as humans, we remember every mistake we ever made. We discount every success we've ever had, right? And and it's we've got it we've got it backwards. And you're laughing because you know it's true, right? You you talk to athletes, they'll remember every shot they missed and celebrate a, a few they made. So change that, flip it upside down. And I think one of the things that I found really helpful is set up little traditions, little triggers. Not only at the end of the day do my wife and I do that, the beginning of every day. I write down five things that I'm grateful for. When my feet hit the floor in the morning, I have a little mantra and I say, today, be kind, be grateful and be of service. Because part of that abundance mentality is serving other people, not taking, giving. I like that. Just repeat your mantra again for me. Be kind, be grateful and be of service. Well, that rather leads me on nicely to what we're going to be doing in the bonus material, which is we're going to look at practice, how to turn some of these um, things that you've learned over the last 12 months and what we've learned over the last 12 months into um, something that goes from, you know, something that you're going, ah, oh, yes, in the podcast into actually turning it into something practical you can do. So thank you very much, Michael, for those. I love the one, the dinner table conversation. What's been the best part of your day? Someone you're grateful to, not at the table, and express gratitude to somebody who hasn't already been thanked around the table. I think that is um, really um, beautiful. So we've got lots of great things coming up on the podcast. We're going to be returning to the subject of infidelity and betrayal again soon. And next week, we're going to be talking to Dr. Catherine Mannix about the importance of listening. Those are all great things. I must say thank you very much to Michael as well for being with me today and helping me look back over the year. And this is not where the conversation ends if you'd like to support us in 2022 because we need your support. This costs money and we would love you to become part of our supportive family. You don't only get that warm glow of knowing that I will be eternally grateful to you which I'm sure is worth a huge amount to you. But you also get to hear the bonus material because every time there is extra material and our plan is to put more and more into that bonus extra material. And if you'd like to find out how to become a supporter, here come the details. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.